So we're going to talk about Prolog. And first, some basics. I like Prolog, but I'm not an expert in Prolog. The last time I did any significant Prolog work was honestly in college. And this is just going to be an introduction. I only have half an hour after all. So what is Prolog? For those who don't know, Prolog is a logic programming language. And what's logic programming language? Logic programming languages uses the, use the concepts of formal logic, induction, deduction, implication, to program. A declarative programming language is a language like SQL that expresses a program without specifying the control flow. And Prolog is a declarative programming language. But most of all, Prolog is a weird programming language. Pretty much everyone I talk to about Prolog has some version of it breaks my brain as their first reaction to the language. What's Prolog used for? Prolog is used for natural language processing. Natural language processing is processing the languages humans use to communicate with each other, both verbal languages and written languages. Prolog is also used for parsing grammars. Again, natural language grammars, but also computer grammars. Prolog has been used for theorem proving, and it's often used for expert systems and other kinds of artificial intelligence work. So why should, do I think you guys should learn program, Prolog? I think you should learn Prolog to expand your toolbox. I'm sure you've all heard the phrase that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If all you know is one or two programming languages, you're going to try to solve all problems using those. And sometimes that's an exercise, exercise in futility. Prolog is very, very good at solving a very specific class of problems. And if you know it, you'll be able to recognize those problems and get your answers quickly. I also think Prolog it changes your perspective on code. You have to think about problems differently and understand your problems a lot more deeply to be able to pro program well in Prolog. And to le learning Prolog helps make you into a polyglot. I saw several talks a couple years ago about how important it was that Rubyists become polyglots and learn lots of different languages so that they had a wider appreciation for computer programming in general. And Prolog is a great one because it's so weird and so different. It really can expand your horizons about how programming works. So let's talk about why it's weird. The biggest weirdness of Prolog is that it's all about the what and not the how. In Ruby, you're probably used to saying, OK, take this array, iterate through it, do these things with the contents of the array. You don't do any of that in Prolog. All you do is describe your problem space really, really well, and Prolog takes care of the rest. And what do I mean by describing your problem space really well? Well, in Prolog, programs are expressed as two things, facts, Kangaroos hop, the sky is beautiful and blue today, those are facts, and rules. An example of a rule would be that even numbers are divisible by two, evenly divisible by two. And as part of the research for this talk, I read this book, parts of this book called The Art of Prolog, and they had this fantastic quote. It says, a computation of a logic program is a deduction of consequences of the program. A program defines a set of consequences, which is its meaning. The art of logic programming is constructing concise and elegant programs that have the desired meaning. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll see some of the power of Prolog and how it really relates to this quote. So the standard hello world example in Prolog is always a family tree. I think that example is boring and relatively lame, and it's been way overdone. So I'm going to pick an entirely different but equally contrived example about coming up with theoretical pairs for, a Seattle, for pair programming night at Seattle RB. So we need to start with some facts. So at a recent Seattle RB meeting, I went around and asked people what editor they use. So ZenSpider uses Emacs, Dr. Brain uses Vim, Pete Figgins uses Vim, and Tenderlove uses Vim. And just for some vocabulary, because I'm going to end up using the formal vocabulary even though I'm trying not to, ZenSpider and Emacs and Dr. Brain and Vim, all of those are what are called atoms in Prolog. And all that basically means is it's a string constant. They start with a lowercase letter. Editor is the name of the rule, and ZenSpider and Emacs are the two arguments for that rule. Just some vocabulary in case I slip up so you can follow along. So in Prolog, once you've got some facts, you can ask questions. I copied over two of our editor rules from the previous slide, or two of our editor facts from the previous slide, and that question mark dash is an interactive Prolog prompt where I can interact with the system, similar to IRB. And so first question I'm going to ask is, does ZenSpider use Emacs? And that's what I'm asking with this editor ZenSpider Emacs line. Prolog looks through the facts it knows and says, yeah, ZenSpider uses Emacs. So then I go, does ZenSpider use Vim? And Prolog looks at the facts it knows and says, no, ZenSpider does not use Vim. Pretty basic. So now we're going to ask a more interesting question. Instead of asking something I already know, we're going to ask a question I don't know the answer to. 
And what we're going to do is that we're going to put a variable in place of one of the two atoms. So that editor there with the capital E, that capital E, capital letter, makes it a variable. In Prolog, all variables start with a capital letter. So what that sentence, what that uh, question is actually asking is, does Dr. Brain, or what editor does Dr. Brain use? And just a side note, yes, questions in Prolog end with a period. Yes, that's weird. Go with it. Um, <laughs> So what Prolog does is it goes for through the facts that it knows about in the order that they're defined in the file. And so the first one says Zen Spider uses Emacs. And what it's going to try to do is try to match the thing I gave it with something it already knows, and then try to fill in the variables with values that make sense. So it tries to match Dr. Brain with Zen Spider. Those don't match. They're not the same. So it skips that line, goes to the next one, goes to the next fact. So now it sees that Dr. Brain matches Dr. Brain. It's like, okay, well, what can I put into that editor variable to make the rest of this fact match? It's like, well, okay, if I make the editor variable match with vim, so I put vim into that editor variable, it'll all match. So then it tells me the substitution it had to make to make the rule, to make my question true. So the output is editor equals vim because it's trying to make the question I asked true. So it just told me that Dr. Brain uses vim. Okay, not actually all that exciting. I could have gone and asked him in the time it took me to explain this. So let's go on to the next one. So in this case, I'm going to ask, to give me a person and their editor. So now I've got two variables, and it does the substitution the same way. It's matching up Zen Spider with the person and editor with Emacs. And just for reference, the colors are here to help uh, illustrate what's going on. Prolog is not normally angry fruit salad, so. This gets a little more complicated. And yes, this is a giant pile of code, so we're going to work through it slowly. So, I have three facts that I've brought over from our facts slide. Tender love uses Vim is the one I've added. And now I've got three sections to my question. In Prolog, when you have multiple sections to a question or a rule, they're called goals. And what Prolog tries to do is it tries to find a set of substitutions that make all of goals true. And if that sounded like formal logic kind of gobbledygook, let's walk through it. And I'm sure with an example it'll start to make sense. So. What we're saying is we need to have find a person who uses Vim. That's the first line. We're going to call that person, person one. We're going to try to find another person, person two, who also uses Vim. And then that last line there with the slash equals equals, that's actually not equals in Prolog. And we're just saying there that we don't want to have person one be the same as person two, because someone pairing with themselves is sad. <laughs> and in Prolog, you use a comma as an and to combine clauses. Comma is and. So what Prolog does is it takes that first, first line, the first goal, and it goes through and it tries to find a match. And the first line it matches that's where someone uses Vim is the line with Dr. Brain uses Vim. So it says, OK, we'll make person one Dr. Brain. Awesome. Now it goes on to the second line. We have person two who uses Vim. Starts at the top, says, oh, cool, Dr. Brain uses Vim. So now person one is Dr. Is Dr. Brain and person two is Dr. Brain goes down to that third line where we've said, person one cannot equal person two, and it goes, oh, that doesn't work. So what it does, what's called backtracking, and it moves back one line, back one goal, and goes back to the facts and picks up where it left off. So we're back on that person two uses Vim line, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna look through the facts it has, and it's gonna pick the next one, which in this case that matches is tender love uses Vim. So now it's gonna say, well, Dr. Brain using Vim didn't match my second line there, so now we'll try tender love uses Vim. So now it comes back down to that not equals line, the third line, and it says, okay, Dr. Brain is not the same as tender love. We found a solution. And so it prints out that my question is true. Give me two people who both use Vim who are not the same when one of them is Dr. Brain and another one is tender love. So now I've just found a pair, a pair of people who use the same editor. And now I can make it even more complicated. I don't actually care if, pe if the editor is vim, I can put a variable in there too. And so now all I've done is I've substituted vim for a variable editor, same exact code beyond that, and now I'm like, give me two people who use the same editor. Tell, that's what I'm asking Prolog. Prolog says, Dr. Brain and Tenderlove have the same editor if that editor is vim. Okay? So at this point I'm getting really sick of typing all this stuff in. There's way too many clauses here. So we make a rule. And what a rule is, is just a shortcut for a bunch of, for a bunch of lines that go together. Bunch of, a bunch of questions we want to ask, and it has a name. So in this case, we're going to name our rule pair. So a per, two people are a pair, and in this case, if their editor is the same and they're not the same person. And you'll see the editor is the same on both of those lines, and as long as the variable has the same name, it is the same value. You'll also notice that editor isn't, editor isn't in my definition, 
because I don't actually care what editor they use as long as it's the same one. They could all be using Ruby mine, it wouldn't bother me. So I go back to my interactive prologue prompt and I say, hey, prologue, give me a pair with person one and person two. And just like we saw before, the first pair it comes up with is Dr. Brain and Tenderlove. So, so far so good, and I don't have to keep typing all that code every time. So, here's, here's another way you can use the rule. You can say, hey, give me all the people who can pair with Dr. Brain, and it comes up with Tenderlove. So you can choose to put constants in there too, atoms in there in addition to variables. So then you can also, in Prolog, ask it for a lot of solutions, because there's probably more than one solution. So I ask it for a pair. It says person one equals Dr. Brain, person two equals Tenderlove. And I type a semicolon, which is the prolog equivalent of or. I'm like, okay, so that's one pair, or give me another one. And it goes, okay, well, you could have Dr. Brain and Tenderlove, or you could have Dr. Brain and Fagans. And I'm like, okay, give me another one. And it's like, or you can have Tenderlove and Dr. Brain. And at that point, I'm like, I think I already saw that pair. And I did, but it was reversed. Person one and person two are distinct in prolog, and it doesn't understand that a pair of Dr. Brain and Tenderlove is really much, pretty much the same as a pair of Tenderlove and Dr. Brain. So let's fix that. And the way we fix that is by taking out our crazy not equal sign and putting in our crazy greater than sign. It's a at greater than, and the at is because it's comparing atoms. It's trying to be a mnemonic. And so now this, now that what this does is it enforces an ordering so that only one of Tender Love and Dr. one version of Tender Love and Dr. Brain is valid. And you've probably seen this in other languages before, especially if you've done anything functional. It's a pretty common way of handling this two possible solutions problem. So now if I ask Prolog, hey, give me two people that compare, it goes, okay, Tenderlove and Dr. Brain, Tenderlove and Figgins, Figgins and Dr. Brain, and then cut off the bottom of the slide is the word no, because it couldn't find anything else. And Prolog really likes saying no a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'll notice, we didn't actually end up with any pairs for Zen Spider in that last set. So I'm like, okay, well, let's come up with a way that Zen Spider can find a pair. So let's do keyboard layouts. So a brief survey of the group, ended up with keyboard layouts of Zen Spider and Dr. Brain used Dvorak, uh, Tenderlove and Figgins used QWERTY, so we've got some rules here. So now we ask similar questions. What keyboard layout does Dr. Brain use? Dr. Brain uses Dvorak. Again, it's doing the pattern matching, so it's trying to figure out how can I make this statement true by substituting values in for the variables. So now we're gonna do a rule, check it out. It's almost the same rule as last time, only we have keyboard and it's in pink because tender love's not here and someone needed to put pink on their slides. And we use the word keyboard instead of editor. And so now I can ask my pairing question again and I can say, hey, give me a pair of two people who have the same keyboard layout because our pair rule right here defines two people who have the same keyboard layout. And Prolog says Zen Spider and Dr. Brain. I'm like, great. So now we've got two rules with the same name. And this may be a little weird, but this is a really standard way in Prolog to say, okay, well, here's one way that you can come up with a solution, and here's another way. And you can have both of these rules in the same file, and Prolog will use them both in order. So I've got these both in a file, and I ask it my question of, give me two people who compare. I've switched to XY because I was running out of room on the slides. Pretty sure you all can follow. And what I ended up with is three answers. The answers in brown are from the Yet editor rule that we saw at the beginning, and the bottom two answers are in pink are from the keyboard rule. So we saw before that Tenderlove and Dr. Brain both use Vim, Tenderlove and Figgins both use Vim, Figgins and Dr. Brain both use Vim, so those are all the editor rules, and then Zen Spider and Dr. Brain both use Dvorak, and Tenderlove and Figgins both use QWERTY, and those are the keyboard matches. And Prolog has no problem having two different definitions of the same rule in the same file, it just uses them in order and uses them all to find answers. And you also notice on this that Tenor and Figgins show up on there twice. I saw that, and I'm like, great, let's make a new rule. We'll call it super pair. The two people who have the same editor and the same keyboard layout are a super pair. So just copy it in the clauses from the other two rules, have our person greater, person one is greater than or equal to person two. It's got this awesome rule, and I ask with my, I copied the facts over, and then we have our question, who's a super pair? And it says Tenor and Figgins. So that's the really basic part of Prolog. And that's kind of the simplest example. So now we're gonna get into lists. Can I have hands raised of anyone who's done any functional programming ever? Scheme, Haskell, ML, something like that. Okay, yay, you guys will follow, this will be awesome. So, Prolog really likes lists. So we've got you know, an empty list, two square brackets, a list of one, two, three, separated by commas, 
got a list of apples and bananas. You can have a heterogeneous list like in Ruby with a number and an atom. It's all cool. You can also have nested lists. So we've got a list of lists at the very bottom. One lemon, one lime, two coconuts. It's a list of lists. And lists have heads and tails. The head is the first, is the first element of a list. The tail is the rest. If you know a schemey language, this is car and cutter. So it should be familiar based on the number of hands I saw who've done functional programming. You've probably seen something like this before. Prolog syntax for this is a square bracket, a variable, or an atom, a pipe, another variable or atom, and a square bracket. And that's that fourth bullet down there, and that's read h bar t. So what I'm saying there is head bar tail. And when I try to match that up with pattern matching, what Prolog does is it says, okay, well, if I'm matching it with a list one, two, three, it says, well, we'll put one in the variable h, and we'll put the list two, three in the variable two, three. So one is the head, the list two, three is the tail. And another random piece of syntax, uh, the underscore means I don't care. Actually, very similar to Ruby, where we use it for anonymous variables or unused variables. Underscore means I don't care. So if I have a list one underscore, Three. It could be the list one, two, three. It could be the list one, pi, three. It could be the list one, the list apple pie, and then a three. Doesn't matter. All pos any possible value can go in that underscore. And it's also slightly important to know that if you have two underscores, they're different. So they both can refer to completely different things. Each and every underscore, each and every don't care is a different value. So with that, we're going to do a, some basic list manipulation. So this is the dumbest definition of include ever uh, in Ruby. Remember, if you're not familiar with functional languages, it takes two arguments. First argument is something to find. Second argument is a collection. If the thing you're trying to find is in the collection, it's true. Otherwise, it's false. So walk through the Ruby really quickly. So we're going to return false if our, well, we're going to use an array here. Our list is empty, because if it's empty, obviously the thing we're trying to find is not there. We'll return true if the thing we're trying to find is at the very beginning of our list, using the zero index position. And then we're going to recurse and try to find the item in the rest of the list. And if you haven't seen that syntax before with the uh, range, that's just everything but the first element in a list. So all we're doing there is we're basically saying, hey, go try to find it in the tail, like just like we talked about. So here's the prolog equivalent. And the lines that are colored the same are functionally equivalent. So the first, claw, the first line, member h, h bar underscore, is saying, hey, something is a member if it's the first thing in the list. The second part in blue is the recursion. It says, OK, well, x is in the list if it's in the tail of the list. So the top line, we're ignoring the head. We're saying, just give me the tail. And then all we're doing is saying, hey, go try to find it in the tail of the list. Really basic recursion. So we'll test it out. So if I say, hey, prolog, is two a member of the list one, two, three? Prolog says true. If I say, hey, prolog, is six a member of the list one, two, three? Prolog says no. OK, so far, so good. We got the code right. So now let's try something different. Let's say, let's put a variable in there. So let's say, hey, prolog, what's, the, what's a member of the list one, two, three? That's why there's a variable there. And so first thing prolog says is one. And at the interactive prolog terminal, you can say, you can type A, which means give me all the results. There are lots of times when this is a bad idea, but right now it's okay. And prolog says, okay, well, the other values that could be X are two and three. So what prolog just did was basically implement an iterator. It just gave us all the elements of the list. And we, to do it, we use the exact same code that we also used for include A, the Ruby equivalent of include. So we're getting two methods for the price of one here. It's actually really cool. But wait, there's more. You can put variables anywhere. So let's put a variable in for the list. So that line where I say member 6x is saying, prolog, give me all of the lists in the entire universe that contain the number 6. And prolog can do this. So the first answer it gives me is, OK, well, any list that has 6 in the first spot obviously contains a 6. And we don't care what's in the rest of the list. Because you know, if 6 is in the first spot, it doesn't matter what's in the rest of the list. I'm like, OK, that's cool. Ask it for the next one, it is, well, any list that contains a six in the second spot contains a six. And you can use a don't care for the rest because, you know, you don't care. It can be anything there. And so on. So what Prolog just did was it generated all lists that contain the number six with the same code that implemented an iterator and the same code that implemented a find. And that's just amazingly powerful because the whole thing was two lines of code. 
So an equally awesome example is with length. The length of a list is obviously uh, how many elements are in it. So first line returns zero if we have an empty list. Second line is we're gonna call uh, length on the rest of the list, figure out how long everything but the first element is, and then add one for the first element. Basic recursive definition of length. Here's the equivalent prolog code. The list is first, then the length of it, because there are no return values, you have to include the value that's the length. So first line says, empty list is length zero. Second line says that we ignore what's in the head of the list because we don't actually care what the elements are to count them. And we say, okay, well, we'll call n1 the length of the tail, and we'll say that n, the length of the list, is the length of the tail plus one. So all the lines line up pretty well. It's just simple recursive definition. Syntax is a little weird. So let's try using it. So we try to use it, and we have uh, a list of a, b, c, d, and we say the length is four, and prolog says, yes, you're right. We ask prolog what the length of the list one, two, three is. Prolog says three. Okay, everything, everything seems to be working so far. So let's ask it what lists are of length two. Totally figures that out right away. It says, okay, well, your list of length two has a square bracket, a don't care, a comma, another don't care, and a close square bracket. Doesn't matter what's in those values, but it just told me what lists, give me all the lists in the world that are of length two. I can't think of another programming language off the top of my head that can do that. That's just amazing that it can just do that and we didn't have to write that much code. Again, three, three lines to do that. So, I've showed you a lot of theory. Let's actually look at some basic examples. Um, circuits, so this is an inverter. It takes an input and gives you the opposite as the output. We're gonna have two facts. An input of zero has an output of one. An input of one has an output of zero. Everyone following along so far? Okay. This is an or, it has two inputs. If A and B are zero, the output is zero. If A is one and B is zero, the output is one. Pretty sure y'all have seen an or before. This is an and, same idea. By now you've probably realized that the facts end up looking very similar to a truth table. If any of you had the CS, back, the CS experience in college I did where you had to write out truth tables for really long expressions, this would have been a much faster way to do it. Here's an XOR, again, there's four facts because there's four possible combinations of inputs. We have a NAND, not AND for those of you who don't know that off the top of your head. So, this is a half adder. Uh, I pulled this wiring diagram off of Wikipedia, and turns out making it in Prolog is really, really easy. I'm like, okay, we've got a rule called half adder. It has an a, an a and a b input, it has a carry bit and a sum, and there's an XOR and an AND, so okay, so you look at the diagram and you're like, okay, so the a and the b go into the XOR and the sum comes out, that's the first goal, and the a and the b go into the the and, and the output is the carry, and that's the second goal, and check it out, you're done. You have a half adder already coded up. Really basic, writing, I mean, writing the facts doesn't take that long. So, you try it out, you're like, oh, I'll just throw a bunch of variables in there. Hey, check it out, it's the truth table for a half adder. Totally done, couple minutes of work. Half adders are kind of boring on their own, so let's make a full adder. So a full adder gets slightly more complicated. You've got some temporary wiring in between the two half adder bits, so, there's one half adder, takes in an A and B and outputs a temporary sum and temporary carry. Take out another half adder that takes a carry in, and it has a sum going out and it has a second temporary carry out, and then you OR the two carries together and that gives you your final carry out. Um, just adding ones and zeros. And again, you take, the, take every box from your circuit diagram and you're able to make it a single line of prolog, hook all the pieces up, all the variables correspond with your wires, really easy, and you end up with a working, half, a working full adder in a couple minutes. So then you can play with your full adder in an interactive terminal. So I can say, okay, well, hey, Prolog, if I have a carry in of one and I want an output, I want a sum of one, what are my possible inputs? Prolog's like, okay, well, that's what that first line translates to, by the way, is I don't care what my inputs are, but I know I have a carry in of one and I want a sum of one. It says, okay, if you want to do that, you can either have two zeros, or two ones, no other options as your inputs. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not actually all that interesting. I'm like, okay, well, what values could give me a carry out of one? And it'll happily generate all that. So that's really simple. 
And it gets even better, because I was flipping through books, looking at this stuff, and I'm like, hey, cool, that's a really pretty circuit diagram. Let's see what it does. So it's got a bunch of NANDs all hooked up, and you just copy all the lines in, you go, okay, well, that first NAND has an A and a B input, and its output is T1, and the second one has an A and the T1, and its output is T2. You just copy all those pieces in, line by line, and you get an output D at the end. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Got it all set up, took a couple minutes, and I'm like, okay, well, Perlog, print me the truth table for this. Put everything in as variables, it ends up printing out the truth table, and I'm like, oh, right, that's exclusive war. And if you actually look at it line by line, that's actually an exclusive war, because everything comes back to NAND in the end. And the thing is, if you think about trying to do this in any other language, I can't think of a language where you're just like, take what you know about the situation. You know that for an inverter, an input of zero gives you an output of one. Or you know for an AND, two ones give you a one. And you can just write those facts down, and then you can put those pieces together in a very logical way, similar to how we would physically put circuits together in the code, and it happily spits all the outputs out. I can't imagine actually trying to code this up in Ruby, because it just wouldn't be as pretty, and it wouldn't mount, model the exact situation that I'm dealing with nearly as nicely. So I've got one more example. Uh, I don't know about you guys, when I was in sixth and seventh grade, I loved these things, these logic problems where you're like, so-and-so has a blue hat and lives in the gray house and has three dogs, and so-and-so and his wife likes tea, and you have to figure out who likes everything. I think they're awesome. And you can actually do really cool things with these in Prolog. So, I picked a really simple one out of the structure and interpretation of computer programs to use as an example. If you like these and want to see more, come find me during lightning talks. I have like six coded up and I'd love to show you. Um, so this is a basic one. There's five friends who live in an apartment building, and their apartment building happens to have five floors, and each person lives on one floor. These are all really contrived, but this is a basic one. So they give us a bunch of clues. Adam doesn't live on the top floor. Bill doesn't live on the bottom floor. Cora doesn't live on either the top or the bottom floor. Dale, li Dale lives on a higher floor than does Bill. Aaron lives on, does not live on the floor adjacent to Cora's. Cora does not live on the floor adjacent to Bill. A bunch of facts there, and then the implied question all the time is, where does everyone live? So let's figure it out. So first we need to kind of pick a data structure. I use it in quotes because there's only one data structure in Prolog, and that is a name and some atoms that are arguments. But we'll just say that we're going to try to get our answer as a list of the people ordered by floor, and for reasons that will become obvious shortly, we're going to say the top is on the left. So it'll go top, then the fourth floor, then the third floor, then the second floor, and then the bottom. And I'm just gonna, the names of, all of our, names of all of our friends are right there, and they have lowercase because they're constants. If they had uppercase, they'd be variables, and that's not gonna work. So those are the five people who live in this apartment building. So um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna build, we're gonna build this up, or I'm gonna build this up with each goal at a time, and then I'll show you how it all fits together into a single rule at the very end. So first goal, Adam does not live on the top floor. So whoever whose name goes in the top variable can't be Adam. That's our crazy not equal sign, slash equals equals from earlier on. Bill does not live on the bottom floor. Again, crazy slash not equal sign. Cora does not live on the top or the bottom floor. Two clauses this time, but two goals. But Dale lives on a higher floor than Bill. So I saw this and I'm like, I don't really want to think about how to deal with that right now, so I'm just going to assume I have this rule that called higher that says that Dale and Bill, and then the L is for the list of all the answers we're going to look for. Is going to, that's our final list of places where people live. And so I'll deal with defining that later. Well, apparently right now is later, so here's the definition for that. Um, and these, there's going to be two special functions in this. If you don't understand them right now, please come find me. I can explain them to you, but I'm running short on time. So this has two clauses. The first one says that if X, who's the person who lives on the highest floor, is the front of our list, Y needs to be somewhere in the tail. It doesn't matter because X is at the front. The second one is our recursive call. It says that if neither of them is in that first spot, and we can use don't care for that, then X and Y need to be higher in the tail. So we just say, okay, well, if neither of them is in that top, is in that first spot on the list, just apply, higher to the apply this higher rule to the rest of the list. That's all that's saying. And then the reason, this is the reason that the highest floor is on the, is on the left, is so that it can be the first one in this recursion. So, now we have a next, our next clue is that Aaron does not live on a floor adjacent to Cora's, and again, we're just gonna define our rule, and then we'll look at the code in a bit. So, here's our code for not adjacent. This is the most complicated piece of code in the entire presentation. So we're gonna take it one clause at a time. So, first, not adjacent. 
x and y are not adjacent, if x is at the front of the list, there's someone z who's acting as the buffer between them, and y is somewhere in the tail. So that's what this says. Um, the x is at the front of the list is from the first line where we do the matching. So x is at the front of that x bar t form. Z is not y, is that, is that first goal. Z does not equal y, which means that that buffer person z can't be either of the two people we're saying are not adjacent. And then member yt is just saying y is somewhere in the rest of the list. So that's one version. Uh, not adjacent does not imply ordering. So the first person may be higher in the building than the second. So this is the exact same rule with the x's and the y's swapped. That's all it is. And then this last one is not adjacent on the tail. And so all this is saying is that we're just going to, if neither of them is the first person on the list, we can't actually def define not adjacent, so just go do not adjacent on the rest. It's, all this is is the recursive call. So that was, our that was our definition, not adjacent. We have one more clue, which is not adjacent, Cora and Bill. And so a couple more things we need to add to make sure we get the solution we want is we need, we need to give Prolog a hint here that our answer is going to be some rearrangement of the five friends' names. Mathematically, rearrangement equals permutation. Permutation is built into Prolog, so all I'm saying is that our answer, L, is going to be some permutation of the five friends' names in this list. Prolog can figure out the permutation bit for us. And I'm going to define, call the rule puzzle. And so we're going to say the rule is puzzle on L. And this little bit of the syntax here of L equals with all these variables is just saying, hey, these are the names of all the pieces of that list that I want to call them so I can use them later on. So putting that all together, we get a bunch of code. We've actually walked through all the lines of this code already. So let's run it. So if I say, hey, puzzle A, B, C, D, E, E, A, B, C, D, E, it gives me the list of people. And because we defined higher on the left, this is actually the list where they live in the building. So Dale's on the top floor, Cora's on the fourth floor, Adam's on the third floor, and so on. And most logic problems, if they're written well, only have one solution. So I, just to check my answer, I type the semicolon to make sure there weren't any solutions. And Prolog says, no, there aren't any solution, other solutions. That's the only one. So at that point, I was pretty sure I got it right. Uh, the slides are on the internet. You can check and make sure that it meets the requirements that were set out, but it does. I'm actually pretty confident in that. So my time's up. So a little bit about learning more. Um, I use mostly books to prepare for this presentation. There are also lots of good videos on YouTube and some websites. I highly recommend The Art of Prolog. It is fantastic, but it is a huge book. It is a textbook. Um, another really great book, The Clause and Effect, Prolog Programming for the Working Programmer, is very good, but very dense, and it's a really tiny, thin paperback. I actually recommend that if you have a little bit of experience with Prolog and you want to learn more. Prolog Programming for Artificial Intelligence is one of the more popular books on Prolog. I have a copy. It's got a lot of great information. And if you're like, okay, Prolog's kind of cool, and I like the idea of being a polyglot, but I'm not willing to invest that much in just Prolog, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks is really well recommended by lots of folks, and it does have a prolog chapter, and the exercises in the prolog chapter are, are a nice introduction. So thank you. <laughs>